Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews, the online show where we dive into the insights of municipal political leaders from across Canada. Our mission on the show is quite simple. Shine a light on the dedicated individuals who day in and day out work around the council table to shape the communities that they call home. Joining us for today's episode is Toronto City Councillor Brad Bradford. Toronto is Canada's largest city and a world leader in business, finance, technology, entertainment, and culture. Its large population of immigrants from all over the globe has also made Toronto one of the most multicultural cities in the world. Are you passionate about local governance and municipal issues? Do you believe in the power of community-driven conversations? Then join us at the Cross Border Network, where we bring together voices from across Canada to shine a spotlight on the challenges and the triumphs of our municipalities. But we need your support to keep the conversation going. Visit crossborderinterviews.ca today to show your support by backing the show monthly or making a one-time annual donation. Your contribution will help us grow and expand our reach, bringing important stories to even more listeners across the nation. Together, we can make a difference. Together, we can amplify the voices of local communities. Together, we can shape a brighter future for all. Cross Border Network, where local matters and your support counts. Visit us today at crossborderinterviews.ca. Councillor, thank you so much for sitting down with me today. It's an honor to finally have someone from the city of Toronto on this show. It's been the white whale that I've been trying to get since I launched the show back in 2018. So I appreciate you taking time to sit down with me and talk about yourself and talk about the city of Toronto. But I want to start by talking about you and talking about the man behind the persona a little bit. So I've got to ask the question that starts off this entire interview, and that is, where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from, Brad? You know what? Probably from my mom. Um, my mom raised three kids on her own, a uh, single mom growing up. And uh, I just saw how important community was around us so that we could be successful, what that meant to us, uh, the challenges facing families, putting food on the table, the struggles of running three kids around and giving them opportunity. Um, so you see how community matters. Um, that was my first exposure to that. Uh, she was always very involved in things and, and still very much role model to this day for me. Um, but I'm also an urban planner by training. And so local government was was a calling for me professionally. Uh, I worked in consulting in the private sector, working on mainly transit projects, actually, even out west, uh, out your way, Calgary, Edmonton, uh, over the years before I went down to Boston, Massachusetts, did some not for profit work down there and then came back to Toronto. And that was when I landed in the chief planner's office, uh, got a job at the city of Toronto as a bureaucrat. And that was really my first exposure to politics. It was my first exposure to local government uh, and all of the opportunity and upside that that comes uh, with with the space and, and also the, all the challenges that I got to see up close and personally. Uh, and, you know, at some point along the way, after being there for a few years, uh, rather than just being a frustrated optimist about it, I said, you know what, stop complaining, put your hand up, try and make it better uh, and serve in a political capacity. Was mom political? Uh, I would describe it as dinner table politics. And so we would talk about politics around the table um, because it mattered. And I could tell you at the time, she was very much not a nonpartisan. I know uh, uh, she, she very much has voted for different parties at different times in different elections, like the vast majority of Canadians. Uh, but yeah, we would talk about it, but we never had a lawn sign up at our place. Uh, we had never been out door knocking or, or anything like that. So it, it was, they were conversations that were important and it was impressed upon us as, as kids that, uh, that elections mattered and, and government mattered and, and uh, it was important for the community. But uh, no, I wouldn't say we were overly political in the household uh, until obviously we got into politics. Local government has often been described by uh, by people on my show and also the past president of Federation of Canadian Municipalities as the government of proximity. You are the closest to the people. You make the biggest impact to the day to day lives. When you decided to put your name on that ballot the first time, what were the weights that the metrics you put into place to ensure that if I do run, I would be the best voice around that council table to ensure that the issues that I believe in and my community believes in would be addressed. 
Yeah, that's a good question. I, I don't know if I thought about it so empirically of different <laughs> metrics, but, um, you know, it was a call to service. And because I was at the city of Toronto as an urban planner, um, you know, and had that sort of daily exposure to both the bureaucracy, which is very dysfunctional, and council, uh, which had elements of dysfunction as well. Uh, I saw it close and, and firsthand. And um, I was involved with an organization called Civic Action at the time, sort of uh, young leadership mentorship program. And I was exposed to these 25 um, fellows that were doing really incredible things, uh, things in the theater space, um, things in food security space, connecting with diverse communities. And I would show up uh, every month and sort of voice my frustrations um, with local government, with our local officials, uh, elected officials. And it was sort of a, not one particular moment, but a gradual burn and exposure to, to people that said, well, hey, like you've got some ideas, you've got some energy, uh, why don't you give it a shot? And I think linking back to your previous question, the fact that I had so little exposure to politics gave me the uh, I guess, naivety about campaigns and, uh, you know, the confidence that I could do it uh, because I was running against a former New Democrat member of parliament who had all of the lists and, you know, party resources and fundraising and all that sort of stuff, name recognition. And keep in mind, I was elected in 2018 for for listeners outside of Toronto. Um, that was the year the premier cut council in half and doubled our ward size. So it was, it's a federal riding. It's, it's 120,000 people. So it was a long journey, but I just sort of believed in the people around me um, who thought our our vision for for government that was focused on results uh, and and ambition was a good one. And you know that's the biggest thing on election night. It's it's nerve wracking, and and you know I speak for myself, I'm, I'm a bit of a mess. Um, but the anxiety that comes with that is you just don't want to let the people down around you that believe in you. And that's what pushes you to keep working hard and hitting those doors and get your message out there, um, make a difference in the community, but also uh, deliver for the people who who support you. Before we talk about your time on council, I have one last question. And it's about that first election, that 2018 election. I remember myself when I first ran for municipal politics in 2010 in Clarington, Ontario, just down the road up the 401 from you. Uh, and I remember going into that ballot box and seeing my name on that ballot. And I was just blown away that my name was up beside some pretty prominent people in the community. When you walked into that ballot box and you saw your name, what was that moment like for you? Pretty emotional. Uh, I could tell you, uh, I had voted early in the morning. And I remember walking in there and and you are overcome with emotion and, you know, excitement, but also the gravity of everything that you've yeah. been for. And, you know, municipal campaigns are long here in Ontario. I had taken an unpaid leave of absence from the city of Toronto. Um, so I was like, you know, four or five months in there without a paycheck, super broke, still at an enormous mortgage because it's housing in Toronto. And uh, all that stuff that weighs on you, the uncertainty of what's going to happen. And we were always running from behind. So I knew, uh, you know, if we were going to win, it was going to be tight. And if we were going to lose, we'd probably lose by, you know, a couple thousand votes. In the end, there was 37,000 votes cast and we won by 288. So, you know, just a, another sort of reminder, every vote matters. But I had a moment. Um, I was I was in a park in the neighborhood off of Gerard Street and I, I was walking up to the sidewalk and this kid stopped me and, and said, like, hey, are, are you Brad Bradford? Uh, I said, as a matter of fact, I am. You recognize the haircut. For those who are listening, I don't have any hair. Uh, but, uh, you know, he said, hey, like you came to my class and you won the student vote. Like, you know, you won the, the vote in the class and, and we all thought you were great. And my parents were originally going to vote for somebody else. But then I went home and talked about, you know, you and your energy and what you want to do for the city and housing. And, you know, now they're voting for you. They're voting for you today. And uh, it was just as uh, like, I'm even getting emotional thinking about it right now. I, I've sort of overcome and um, with emotion and, and a bit of tears there in the moment, because all of that work in the months leading up, it becomes real for you as a candidate, but for also people in the community and to connect with that kid. I still remember him, Spencer. Uh, he's gone on to RMC and, you know, he's serving the country right now and, and doing incredible work. But this was six or seven years ago. He was a lot younger and uh, it's something I'll never forget. Your time on council, I can imagine, has been challenging because the city of Toronto has been going through some major changes, some major growth and some major challenges. But as a councillor yourself, 
How do you make those tough decisions? Because I can imagine that, you know, at the end of the day, when you raise your hand or you push that button to vote on a certain issue, 100 percent of the people in your city are not going to be in favor of that decision that you have made. So for you, how do you make those tough decisions from your perspective? You know, it's always going back to your value set and, um, you know, what is the type of city that we want to achieve? What is the direction that the city and the municipality needs to go? And then cross tabbing that with whatever the issue of the day is in front of us. And does that align with that vision for Toronto? And for me, it's, it's a city of opportunity. It's a city that's more accessible. It's a safer city. It's a city where we support uh, people who want to invest and bring their ideas, their time, their talent, their treasure to Toronto and build something better. And so, you know, whether we're talking about transit or congestion or housing um, or, you know, parks and recs, things that make the city livable, it all has to be channeled with uh, that that vision and going back to that value of set of does this answer the call of that vision for Toronto? Um, and, you know, not to sound Pollyanna about it, but if, if you go back to that value set, it, it often offer, offers a lot of clarity and, and guidance. Um, that is not to say that there's not compromise and that, you know, you're not putting a little bit of water in your wine from time to time. And, you know, there's always those situations where, you know, perfection cannot be the enemy of good. And sometimes you got to just move the the ball down the field. Um, but, uh, that's, that's kind of where I start. And, um, I've also had a, a process of growth and evolution and just exposure and learning how to do the job as, you know, I'm now in my second term, six years in. Um, it's just like a mechanic or, you know, a doctor or a teacher, uh, you're better and more effective in your position after you've had some more experience and been through, uh, been through the process a few times. And I think I'm finding my stride sort of six years in, I know I'm, I'm a lot better today than I was when I started. Uh, but I also have a lot more growth, uh, in front of me and, and it's just having the humility to acknowledge, um, when you don't get it right and what you can learn from. And certainly I've made plenty of mistakes and I just try and learn from those and take it going forward. Do the tougher, do the tough decisions get easier to make as time goes on? Like looking back on that first budget that you uh, passed in 2018 to, I'm assuming you're going through budget talks right now and you do a multi-year budget process, but looking back at those tough decisions you had to make and now did the decisions get easier to make or are they as hard as they once were when you first were elected? Um, I think it's always difficult. Uh, budget is the process of prioritization. Yeah. Uh, and, and so those are difficult conversations and things that you have to weigh clear, clear, um, you have to weigh carefully. But for me right now, uh, I've never had more mission clarity than I have today. And I think, you know, it, it's no secret. I went through a by-election uh, last year in the mayoral by-election, the election we didn't anticipate. I got smoked. Um, there was a lot of reflection and humility and, and, uh, learning in that very humbling experience. And so, but now it's so clear who I'm fighting for, what the city needs to do. And and the administration now has, a, has, you know, in some respects, a different vision on some of those things. So in a way it's actually, it's easier now um, because there's things where we can work together, like all local governments and things where there's alignment and other things where it's, it's quite a bit of a different vision. Uh, and so in that sense, I know how I'm going to vote um, because there's there's disagreement on some of those things uh, and that makes it easy. And where there is agreement or opportunities to collaborate, you know, we try and work together to, to find an island, uh, something that, you know, all of us can support. And I think that's healthy for democracy. But I would say when I was working with Mayor Tory, you know, there was a lot more alignment there. Um, but even still, some votes where you know, it, it was uncomfortable and you're trying to figure out where you're going to land on those things. Um, but that's how you grow as a person. That's how you learn. Um, but today, having been through what I've been through and where I think that the city is headed right now, um, yeah, I have a lot more clarity in, in what I need to do. We're going to talk about the city of Toronto and some of the challenges and accomplishments in a few seconds. But I have two last questions before we do turn to that. And one of them is you have to make decisions for the best of your the ward that you represent. But you also have to make decisions for the best of the city as a whole. When you're voting, you're not just voting on your ward's issues. You're voting on all city issues. How do you balance the needs of the many with the needs of your community? Because 
the needs of the city as a whole will always outweigh the needs of the community because you have big major city issues. So as a counselor, is it challenging to balance those two opposing sometimes fra fractions of the city? I think in Toronto, it's interesting. I mean, it never really comes down to, oh, you know, we're going to fund a, a park in Etobicoke and we're not going to fund a park in Beaches East York. Like it's, yeah. It's never sort of hunger games on on capital dollars for specific projects because it's done in a 10 year capital plan. So we all have a line of sight into that when these projects are getting booked, how they get reshuffled based on procurement and all the sort of minutia of what makes government work and more often not work. Um, so it, it, it it's less about that. I think the most contentious discussions at council are often related to the big city issues. And, and we'll get into some of that. But I would also add most of the time historically anyways when people are thinking about issues in their ward it's often related to development it's often the pressure uh that counselors face because they're rewarded at the ballot box for saying no to housing rather than saying yes to housing and so you see a lot of a lot of counselors here in toronto historically who have taken that position uh because it's much more popular to you know vote in favor of the people who are there today rather than uh, to support the potential neighbors who could be there tomorrow. And there's a long history of, of nimbyism from our elected officials in this city that goes back to amalgamation 20 years ago. Uh, but that was never me. Like I ran in 2018 as an urban planner, as a pro growth, as a housing guy, and people elected me on that. So I've never struggled with that uh, in terms of bringing more housing. And, and certainly my time as the planning and housing chair led a lot of important reform that is effectively setting the table, ending exclusionary zoning, uh, fixing our, our mid-rise and avenues policies, introducing multiplex, all this stuff that has set the table that when the market corrects and we have an improvement in conditions for, for building, we will bring more housing opportunities into more neighborhoods. And that is definitely the, the supply side solution to the housing crisis facing a lot of municipalities, but definitely here in Toronto. So that's the issue that I think trips up a lot of people um, when they're first elected on council. But for me, you know, where I was coming from, in my views, I campaigned on that and I've always been about it. Uh, so I don't, I don't really struggle with that one. So my final question in this segment before we turn to the city is apathy. Now, across this country, I would say, and I hate painting a broad stroke, but I'm going to, that the issues that are going on at City Hall are not as prominent in everyday people's lives. The people, as long as my taxes are low and the garbage is picked up, I'm comfortable with what's going on in City Hall. But Toronto is a unique beast in itself because it is the largest city in this country, and it is they often were described as the 14th province or territory in Canada because you do have so much sway on the federal and provincial scale. Do you get a sense that people are comfortable or understand the day-to-day -day minutia of what's going on at City Hall and they will be engaged with you if you ask for their opinion? Well, people will always give you your opinion, their opinion, whether <laughs> They want whether you want to or not. Uh, so I, I hear from folks all the time, whether I'm walking down Danforth or going to the grocery store or on the subway or, you know, taking my daughter to swimming. Um, so I hear from people a lot. And I think that's actually so important uh, when you're an elected official is constantly being on the ground and hearing from your constituents what their priorities are, their hopes or aspirations and their frustrations and being able to respond competently with empathy, but also with solutions to their frustrations. Um, yeah, I mean, like I, I always talk about this all the time. Local governments where the rubber hits the road. Um, even when I was an urban planner, uh, I could talk to anyone about planning, not in a zoning bylaw perspective, but, you know, from a housing affordability perspective. You can't find anyone in this city that hasn't been impacted by the housing crisis, whether that is their their aging parents who want to stay in the neighborhood or a young family who's trying to uh, come into Toronto or, you know, someone they work with that, you know, got run evicted from their apartment. Um, so transit, congestion, parks and open space, housing, like these were always planning issues. So I could always talk to somebody about planning, whether or not they identified it that way. And the same is true of local government. I yeah. think the, the politics at the top right now, there's so much toxicity in the federal conversation um, that it takes up all the oxygen. But when you distill those issues, housing, affordability, 
transit, um, small business, a lot of that stuff manifests on our main streets, in our neighborhoods, in our municipalities, big and small across this country. And so there's always a conversation to have. But to your point, Chris, it is difficult connecting the dots for people in an intuitive way that like, no, 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 we're talking about local government issues. Uh, and, and I think that is the conversation that we need to continually engage in because it's so important and it matters and their perspective is, is, uh, important to, to making sure that we have government that's responsive to the needs of people here in the city. Looking at the city as a whole now, I want to turn to our focus to that because I think this is going to be the more meat and uh, potatoes of the conversation. But in your opinion, as of recording this on October 31st, 2024, what do you see as the biggest challenge or challenges facing the city of Toronto today? Writ large, it's affordability. I mean, this city has never really? been. Yeah, it's never been more expensive. And we'll get into why it's expensive, but it's never been more expensive and less affordable than it is today. And that manifests in the way people get around, the way they navigate 640 square kilometers of the city of Toronto. It manifests in their ability to find an apartment that they can afford. It manifests in their ability to put 20% equity down on a house to get up on the property ladder and get into home ownership. Uh, yeah, it's hugely expensive. And the challenge for local governments, but particularly here in the city of Toronto where affordability is so acute, is a lot of the folks who are growing our economy, who are doing the jobs, who are paying taxes, uh, who are contributing to our GDP, they're leaving. They're heading out to Alberta where you are. Uh, it's a flight for affordability. They're going into the GTA. They're going uh, to other provinces, interprovincial uh, migration, or they're going south of the border. And the Board of Trade here in Toronto noted that 50,000 people left the city of Toronto last year in that flight for affordability. And I think that is the biggest risk to this city, which has benefited from tremendous investment and attention, um, bringing talent and growth here over the past two decades. But that future success, that future investment is not guaranteed. And these people that I'm talking about, they don't qualify for any subsidies. They don't qualify for any programs. You know, national average, they would make a decent income. They make too much money to qualify for any programs or supports, but not enough money to afford to live here. So the risk for Toronto is that we go the way of, you know, many U.S. cities where you have a, a concentration of global wealth and you have a concentration of poverty and a hollowed out middle class, a hollowed out core of people who need to be here to be doing the jobs to continue to grow our economy. That's the biggest writ large existential issue, how it manifests in all the the different sort of subtopics is, you know, fruit for further discussion. But that's the thing that we have to keep in mind at the top of uh, top of the conversation. But the municipality doesn't have a role to play in addressing. A, I shouldn't say that the municipality can't uh, dictate all the external factors that go into the affordability crisis. There are world issues that are going on right now that are affecting prices, whether it be oil, whether it be food prices. There's uh, internal domestic issues. Inflation is high. So what does the municipality's role, what is the municipality's role in addressing this affordability crisis? Because you have so many limited resources and tools in your tool belt as a municipality that you can't just dictate tomorrow the affordability crisis is going to be done. It's going to be, and I hate to use this word, but it's going to be a hard trek until we get to a place where things will be more affordable. And it's not going to happen because of an election or a new prime minister comes in or even new premier comes in. It's going to be an ongoing issue that we're going to have to deal with. So what does the city do in the short term to address those facts? What's the biggest bill that you think Torontonians pay every month here in the city? Property taxes. Well, so that's that's the biggest single check that they write each year and last <laughs> yeah. year, the historic, historic tax hike. But the biggest monthly expense for most people is their cost of housing, whether okay. they are renting or whether they are paying a mortgage that has gone up significantly with, with interest rates. But the biggest monthly bill that most people face is their housing costs. And when you think about that, I mean, the reality is nobody makes more money off of housing than government. It's not just the city. It's all three levels of government. But we're living in a world here in the city of Toronto where development charges have increased 1,200 percent over 12 years, 40 uh, percent over the past two years in particular. And so that is not sustainable. Um, you look at our desire to have more purpose built rental. We talk about PBRs and not the beer all the time here in the city. Uh, and, and we want more of that because we know, again, people are coming to the city. We want them to come here. Generally, you start you start you try and find an apartment you can afford. 
Um, but right now, if you were to build a 500 unit apartment building in the city of Toronto on a transit line, which federal policy, provincial policy and city policy all encourages, you would be stuck with $13 million in development charges. And that's just the DCs. That's not parkland dedication. That's not all the, the fees associated with your application. So we have a disproportionate impact on the cost of housing that more often than not is a direct pass through if the projects actually go forward to consumers. And so we need to peel back that process that I would agree for a variety of reasons, uh, municipalities have had to get creative about how they raise revenue, but the default position has just been to broaden the scope of the development charge purview, throw everything, including the kitchen sink in there. And that's made housing prohibitively expensive. It's compromised the economic viability of projects. So we have tens of thousands of units in paper approvals that are sitting on the sidelines that are never going to get built because the economics don't work. And uh, and it, it fundamentally exacerbates the supply challenge of people who are coming to the city, uh, but there's nowhere for them to live. Supply and demand, the unit prices go up. So I didn't even get into the process part where we have had the unenviable statistic of having the slowest approval timeline in North America in nearly three years to go through an official plan amendment, additional time for zoning bylaw and site plan. But time is money and all this stuff that we control here at the city of Toronto increases the cost of housing, limits the amount of supply, and ultimately makes it more expensive for people to call the city home. So I can't <laughs> fix global economic factors, but there are things that we can do here in Toronto to expedite that process that would translate into affordability. That's the biggest bill that people pay every month. And that's why cities need to lead, lead on this issue. Can I ask a very political, very political question right now? And I apologize if it comes out of left field. So who's, AMA, to, blame for, who's to blame for that then? Because this issue does not just did not come up yesterday, where you have high development costs. Who's to blame? Is it the city? Is it the mayor? Is it the developers? Is it the external forces that the province and the federal government aren't giving their fair share to the uh, city to offset some of these costs? How, who 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 shares the blame on this situation that has led to the affordability crisis in the city? I think everybody that you just outlined has had a role. Uh, I don't think it's one person. Um, you know, the challenge is bad policy has gotten us into yeah. this position, but but the good news is good policy could get us out of it. Uh, so there is some upside on that. And it's not that difficult um, to sort of figure out, but it's, it's all of those factors. Uh, and I think you couple that with the sort of electoral politics that again, back to what I was saying earlier, has historically rewarded a NIMBY perspective, which has uh, inadvertently restricted supply uh, that has exacerbated the challenge of ensuring that we have a supply of homes for people who would like to live here. When we restrict the supply, the costs go up. So all that sort of stuff. And I think it, it's rooted in politics and the politics of hopefully yesteryear. Um, but at the same time, um, it's a conversation about the span and the scope of government. Um, you know, we really ought to be focused on delivering core services here in the city of Toronto. We ought to be focusing at delivering it at a 10 out of 10 level rather than trying to be everything to everybody and doing it at a 60 percent level. You know, I'm so sick and tired of like shooting for third and being happy that we come in fourth or pointing to an OECD list and like, oh, we're number 18 on that. Pat ourselves on the back. Like, give me a break. Like, there's a lot of things that we ought to be doing better and have more accountability and more leadership and more, um, frankly, like what? control. Well, give me example, an example of what you could be doing to make your the city better tomorrow. Well, let me tell you that this year we had a historic tax increase, nearly 10 percent in the city of Toronto. And it was done under the guise of the promise of better services for residents. And there are people out there that would say, OK, yeah, you can raise my taxes a bit, but I want to see better services. Well, then we have a, a report from the auditor general that comes out two weeks ago that says half the time uh, a city of Toronto park staff are not in the parks. So like. That's the lack of accountability. Uh, that's the lack of oversight to make sure that we are delivering value for money, that we are delivering on the promises of better services, because we're certainly delivering on the promise of raising the taxes. But, you know, you're not seeing the waste bins or the lawn cut uh, or the change rooms open if people are not on the site where they're paying to, being paid to be there uh, and, and they're only there half of, half of the time. And that's, again, not to paint everyone with a broad stroke, but these are the findings of the AG. And I yeah. think it's damning because those are the sort of things where people get cynical on local government. Uh, the public ought to rightly demand better from the city of Toronto, and we're not delivering it right now. You know, another example, 
spending $150 million on a two kilometer bike path. And that will blow the minds of a lot of your listeners. Uh, it certainly blew my mind here in the city of Toronto. And, you know, that sort of stuff just gets signed off with a shrug right now. Like, my goodness, that's a six times cost escalation from when it was originally tabled. And, you know, again, you're going out and you're taking more money and we're crying poor all the time. Uh, but then you're paying $75,000 a meter for a bike path in a rail corridor. That's nuts. So, like, you know, there are structural challenges with the feds, with the province, with local government. But we also need to have the, the clarity of mission, what we ought to be focused on, and we need to be delivering it at a better level. And if that means we can't be everything to everybody, then so be it. Um, we need to get the basics right. And in Toronto right now, I think we're pretty far from that. So how do you get the basics right when you have your role as a municipality that you have to play? But we all know, and I worked for, at Queen's Park, and I know that downloading does happen to municipalities, and it happens on a regular basis to municipalities. So if the provinces continuously downloads and they're currently uploading, they're saying we're going to take over bike lanes and we're going to tell municipalities that you can't have bike lanes on some of your major roads. How does the municipality have to respond? Do you just say, we're not going to deal with it? Or is there a way that the city can move forward to work in partnership with the Ford government or work in partnership with the Trudeau government to address some of these downloads that they have been so happily to give to you as a municipality? Well, you know, um, downloading from this government, uh, it certainly happened with respect to, you know, not to get into this sort of minutia of it, but community benefits charge, changing yeah. the section 37 regime of the planning act. But, but effectively uh, that was a big hit to municipalities to be able to fund the infrastructure that we're talking about. Um, and again, I think we need a whole development charge review. Um, sorry, did, did I sign out here? No, nope, you're still, still here. Okay. My zoom thing just cut out. Um, we, we need a, we need a review of our development charge structure and what actually qualifies as an eligible expense for DCs. But put that to the side, this government did upload transit capital transit expansion. Uh, and that was a, that was a met with a lot of resistance. Interestingly at the time, um, you know, there was the big campaign, keep transit public, which, you know, as I understood, it always was going to be public. It's just another government, which is still public, but um, that was a huge upload. And I think it was worth $28 billion or something back in 2018. And, and for the first time, we're actually seeing new transit projects started, started at speed. We're still struggling to, to finish the old ones, Eglinton Crosstown, which is, you know, a, a popular political punching bag here in this city. But that was positive. And across the go, country. <laughs> yeah. But if you go back, yeah, exactly. We're a big joke. Uh, everybody likes to pile on Toronto. And I, as a guy who grew up in Hamilton, I, I get it. Um, but the, uh, you know, the downloading that happened in the 90s, certainly under the Harris government um, here in Ontario, has been extremely problematic and, and municipalities have never really found their footing on the other side of that. So how do you how do you work through it? Well, I think you have to be able to read the room and depending on whoever is in power, whether that is, you know, uh, Trudeau or Polyev at the at the federal level or uh, Ford or Crombie municipally focus on the shared priorities. Um, and put your time and energy into that. So uh, if, if the provincial government is really in interested in affordable home ownership programs or a particular part of the city, but there is a uh, waterfront LRT that is going to be required to unlock all of that development density, then let's start having a conversation about how we're going to pay that. Um, because you have an interest in unlocking that particular section of the city and seeing some growth in housing there. And so do we, but we all understand that it's going to require, you know, additional sewage capacity and water pumping and a new waterfront LRT system to be able to do that. Focus on those shared priorities and to the mayor's credit, uh, you know, she's had some success in being able to uh, navigate these negotiations. Um, she campaigned on tearing down the gardener. Um, so it was quite a reversal to ensure that it'll be here for the next 100 years. But I agree with that. Like, we need to have that critical arterial uh, capacity on the south end of the city. And, you know, the Ford government stepped up and uh, they are now uploading that off our books after it was downloaded in the 90s by the Harris government. So, um, you know, it's I think it always comes down to focusing on your shared priorities and working together is better than working at odds. Although sometimes you got to dig in, draw the line and, and take a swing. Um, because you don't want to see our municipalities, uh, you know, big footed uh, by other jurisdictions. Um, and sometimes you got to stand all that stuff, too. We, we You talk about how uh, the punching the Toronto kind of is the punching bag for some other municipalities. Do you think Toronto gets a bad rap at the end of the day? Because 
whenever you hear federal politicians or even the provincial politicians in Ontario talk about challenges, they always use Toronto as the kind of poster child of what things are going wrong and how we can make things better. But there's got to be good things that are going on in the city that you were proud of. So do you think there are that Toronto does get a bad rap when it comes to what, how it's portrayed? And what are the accomplishments that you look at and you say, you know what, we do have our challenges. Affordability is a challenge, but we have these things going for us. Well, for sure. I, I think Toronto, we're 20% of the national GDP and, yeah. and not to flex on that, but like it's a big part of the Canadian economy. Uh, and so whoa, whoa, whoa. Toronto, you're saying that to an Alberta show. You're just, you've just lost no, no, every no. single it, Albertan in the whole show. It, it, <laughs> no, I, I, I recognize that, but I like it, it's a big part of the Canadian economy and Toronto's success is very indicative of, of the success of the country. And I, I think people understand that again, even as a Hamiltonian, you know, I, I certainly appreciated that, uh, Toronto has a big role to play in our success as a province and a country. Um, that being said, I think our missteps are also, um, you know, they manifest in a big way as well. We're a city of 3 million people. We're the fourth largest city on the continent right now. And so when we step in it, it's usually pretty consequential. And like I just referenced, you know, the, the mayor's $150 million bike path, like those sort of cost overruns are at a level that it's orders of magnitude um, bigger than a lot of other places. And that's not, um, you know, because we necessarily screw it up in a different way or because it's more important. It's just, it's, it's a size of the, the scale of the investment. And so then the problems and the cost overruns and the delays often manifest themselves in a big way also. But that being said, you know, because of our size and because of our scale, um, opportunity is, is also available at that size and scale. And I think we continue for all of our challenges and, and, the difficulties of, of raising a family here or growing a business here or navigating uh, the city of Toronto, which has never been more difficult to get around. Um, you look at the co global context and we're still very attractive. Um, you know, we've got stable democracy, stable government. We are the most diverse city in the entire world. Uh, for a long time, we've been a very safe and peaceful and accommodating city. Um, that has sort of eroded over the, uh, the past year with some of the conflict uh, overseas. We're starting to see that on our streets here too. But generally speaking, great education, great healthcare, uh, a very diverse city. And, you know, I think when people globally survey all of their options, they still see Toronto as a pretty good one. And our success is, um, you know, very much attached to the ability to continue to attract investment, continue to attract people. Uh, we just need to make sure that we're doing it in a way where we're not displacing folks here and that, you know, Again, those people who are working the jobs that are really important, they're making good money, but not enough money. We always have to have a lens to affordability so that we don't have a talent drain, interprovincial migration, uh, people leaving the country to take opportunities elsewhere because you cannot take our future success for granted. It's not going to happen if we just fall into a pathway of status quo. Um, we have to maintain our competitive edge. We have to maintain our hunger. Uh, we got to be ready to compete in a global context and, and keep fighting for those people, keep fighting for those dollars and those talents in, in, in order to ensure that we can continue to enjoy a prosperity agenda here in Toronto. In a perfect world, what would a Toronto look like in 2050 if Brad Bradford had his way? I think I want the same thing that most folks want, which is a safe, affordable city, a city where, you know, you have uh, opportunities in front of you to better your life for yourself, to better your life for your family, for your community. Uh, so, you know, we make it very difficult to run a business here in the city of Toronto. Uh, the licensing regimes, dealing with even things in the right of way, like transportation services, building permits, like we have a lot of red tape. Uh, and, you know, I think for a lot of folks today, if they were deciding whether or not they're going to build a small business here in the city of Toronto or virtually anywhere else in the GTA, a lot of people would say, yeah, I'm, I'm going to go somewhere else. Um, we need to pull some of that stuff back. We need to celebrate entrepreneurs. Uh, we need to create an environment where Toronto's big, uh, the big business city of the country, Toronto, is in fact a city where, where we can reward people for, for bringing their investment uh, and their energy and their ideas. Uh, I'm not sure if we're there right now. We really don't spend a lot of time talking about that anymore. Um, and we're still a city that's trying to struggle with our recovery post-pandemic. Uh, downtown core is still a shell of what it once was. 
Um, you know, that, that is impacting commercial property values. Like a lot of municipalities, we over index our taxes on commercial because we don't want to do residential tax increases. And eventually we're going to have to do reassessments here, uh, in the city and in the province. And I think there will be a lot of property values that actually go down, um, because we haven't assessed them since 2018. Um, you've got class A office space, which is, you know, brand new, super sexy, fantastic places. Those, uh, those are rented out. You also have class C office space, which is, you know, uh, not as attractive, but it's very cheap. So there is a market for cheap, but it's the class B office space. You know, maybe it's a 1980s building, uh, 1980s model like me. And uh, it's it's less competitive. It's less appealing. It's not affordable. And I think you'll see property values go down on that if we don't find a way to get people in and out of the city, get them back to work, get them to supporting the restaurants and the bars uh, outside of work hours, doing the shopping downtown. Uh, and again, if, if our downtown is not thriving and vibrant and successful, it's sort of indicative of the city of, as a whole. So we've got a lot of work to do on on the economy front. Um here in Toronto. And, and we're not talking about that enough. We need to focus more of our attention on it because we cannot take it for granted. One economic driver that I like to talk about on this show is tourism. And this is my last area before we wrap up. And I've got to ask, is there a spot in the city or even in your ward that you are most proud of that you think is a hidden gem that you just love to go to or people should visit while in the city of Toronto? Oh man. Uh, Tough to give you one, but like I, asking I call the Sophie's it, Choice question, right? Now. <laughs> yeah, no, no. Like, look, as a as a uh, as an urban planner, we talk about things like uh, you know the green belt. I describe Beaches East York as the family belt. Uh, yeah. So many young families, because at one point in time there was um, you know more affordable housing options in the East End. I still remember um, the first time my wife and I made our way into the neighborhood. We had been looking all over the city of Toronto, and in fact, I was a little partial to the West End as a Hamilton kid. Still got friends and family back that way. Uh, so I was kind of looking over there and and I had a buddy that said, yeah, you know, check out the West End. And when you're ready to actually buy something, come out to the East. And um, I remember on a Thursday night, we took the subway out, got off at Woodbine Station, which is right on Danforth. And we walked up. It was maybe six o'clock. Saw the sun setting in the West on the skyline. Saw Eastland Park, Farmer's Market, all these families, music, stuff going on. And we said, wow, this is uh, this is actually something really special. We turned off the listings all over the city and just focused on that neighborhood. And this was 2015, 2016. So, you know, at the time, everything was a bidding war. And we it took us like six max bids on different houses to finally land one. Um, but it's a family oriented neighborhood. It's a neighborhood that's got great amenities. Uh, we've got the beaches, of course, which are really a gem in the entire city of Toronto. Best blue flag beach uh, in the province is, is at Woodbine uh, and a lot of great local businesses. I was at a place called Johnny Baker's last night up in East York, a historic institution um, that a lot of memories and, and families go there. We've got like the coal mine theater that hopefully is going to have a new permanent location and a new development right on Danforth. So bringing arts and culture to people, making a destination for the whole city. We've got great coffee shops. Cafe Kokoro, um, you know, is right on Danforth as well. Um, great, great spots on Girard and Kingston Road and, and down to the beaches. One of my favorite breweries, Beaches, beaches Brewing. I'm a, I'm a beer guy, but I like the beer that actually tastes like beer, not all the fruit. Uh, so I don't know, like it's tough to name one and I didn't, but um, uh, I appreciate all, your honesty. all of these. We're a city of neighborhoods and even within a ward, um, there's all these different little neighborhoods and they all bring something to the table. And, and that's why <laughs> there's no other city in the world to live in like Toronto. And for all of our challenges, uh, my goodness, there's a lot on the table there that's that ought to be celebrated. And it's how do we go from strength to strength? How do we build on the success that we've already had uh, and make sure that it is a city that is safe and affordable and accommodating for families where we're celebrating entrepreneurs, where we're building businesses and we're promoting growth and prosperity? That's what we got to be laser focused on. And so every decision comes down to that one way or another. And I will always index on the side of, of how can we better be better tomorrow with the decisions that we're making today. Counselor, I want to thank you so much from the bottom of my heart. I said 45 minutes and we're just at the 45 minutes now. So I want to thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to sit down. It's an honest, honest to goodness pleasure to meet you virtually. But hopefully when I'm in Toronto or at the FCM or AMO next year, we'll meet in person. We can have a further conversation on these issues. So thank you so much. 
big fan of the pod, Chris. Thanks for giving voices to Canadian municipalities and uh, keep up the good work and we'll see you out there. Thank you so much for tuning in for another episode of Cross Border Interviews. We hope you've enjoyed today's conversation with one of Canada's municipal leaders making a difference within their own community. If you haven't already, be sure to hit that subscribe button so you never miss an upcoming episode. Your support helps us to continue to grow and bring you these important conversations like you've heard today. So stay connected, stay informed, and we'll see you next time here on Cross Border Interviews.